Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Supriya Dr. Bardi. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. I'm the moderator of this session, which we call um, <clears throat> Space Science Enabled by uh, Missions that have been developed by non governmental entities as well as commercial. Uh, I'm quite honored to have a great panel. Um, our first uh, panelist is uh, Peter Warden, uh, who is the chairman of Breakthrough Foundation. Uh, he is also a physicist uh, with a uh, degree in uh, physics. Um, he also um, uh, was a, a, a U.S. Air Force uh, Brigade General and a director of uh, NASA Ames. Uh, research center. If I go talking about his and other panelists' bios, uh, it'll take most of the time, so I'll stop there. Uh, the second panelist is Kress Bosujan, another astrophysicist, uh, and also he's a, an astronaut. Uh, he has, he's a founder of Planet Labs, uh, which is very relevant to, uh, to our discussion today. And uh, as you probably all know, that Planet Labs have uh, produced a lot of terrestrial remote sensing data that are already being used by scientists all over the world. Uh, our final uh, panelist is Alfreda Hall, uh, who is the project manager of NASA Commercial Small Data Acquisition Program. So you can see the, how our panelists complement each other's background. I'm going to just say a few words about where we are. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of global space economy, just pointing out it's large uh, and spans many different areas uh, and um, can all read. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but also if you want to take a deep dive, you can see some of the areas where uh, people are spending uh, money in, in space uh, and related activities. Some are satellite services, some are manufacturing, launch industry, etc. Um, and these are old data that are updated. I'm just trying to keep everything similar because they refer to a chart that I got from FAA uh, was from 19, uh, 2018. This is another uh, uh, way we can put things in perspective uh, in terms of this uh, history of science, space launches. Uh, in the first launch, of course, was in uh, 1957. Since then, uh, for, a, for a long time, the number of launches hovered around hundreds. These days, this number of satellites that are being placed on orbit are in thousands per year. So things have changed dramatically. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons are the satellites that are being used now are smaller. And uh, here is again a more recent um, uh, set of data um, that shows how the number of small satellites or nano satellites have been increasing dramatically. Um, and different, uh, they're used by different organizations, uh, universities, uh, and funded by in the US National Science Foundation and NASA and, and military, commercial, etc. Uh, and then they're also used for various applications. In this case, for the discussions that we're having, science is uh, the, the, the red, um, uh, those uh, number of CubeSats, these are small satellites. Again, the panelists could elaborate on this. They are being used for uh, different applications. Some are science, some are engineering, educations, et cetera. And in the National Academy of Sciences talked about how CubeSats are being used um, for science applications. Again, our discussion, this is sort of the starting point for our discussion. And a more recent report elaborated on a specific uh, science area, earth and ocean remote sensing, how they have benefited by leveraging commercial space. Uh, so, so this is setting the stage and so some of these conclusions that are uh, been reached by this uh, uh, the, in, the, in the National Academy report talked about the expectation that there will be tremendous growth. Uh, commercial uh, stakeholders will rely upon uh, the commercial services. 
And, uh, and then they are talking about how it can benefit. We all could benefit. Uh, since I am at an university, I look primarily at uh, the scientific results, but these are only one part of it. And you'll hear uh, from the panelists uh, a, a wide range of applications that are being uh, you know, imagined. So uh, what you can see are that the signs that involve commercial uh, remote sensing, terrestrial remote sensing have already benefited from the availability of data produced by uh, commercial entities such as Planet Labs. Uh, the astrophysics is you know, sort of uh, being ready uh, for the next step. And uh, um, there are several examples. One example is being developed in Europe called the Project Twinkle. It is uh, uh, developed by a private company and uh, also a citizen science uh, aspect of this where they want to collect data that could be used on, on a very specific astrophysical science and exoplanetary science. Uh, and um, then the question is what's up next? Where could we go in planetary sciences? So these are some of the questions I posed uh, with uh, the panelists, and I'm hoping that they could pr provide a lot more information for you. So with that, uh, I invite, uh, Dr. Warden to, to make some comments about where Breakthrough Foundation is, uh, you know, relevant. Well, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me and see my charts all right? We can. Great. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is some of the things that, uh, that we just heard about. Uh, uh, I'm the uh, chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. And uh, I lead the Breakthrough Initiatives, which are a privately funded effort to uh, search for life in the universe. And I'll show you a little bit about them and some of the projects that we're doing and beginning to start, which uh, I think are very much relevant to uh, privately funded uh, 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 space science. Uh, uh, the fundamental questions of our initiatives are really three that, uh, and we started in 2015, uh, the, the Principal sponsor is Yuri Milner, a uh, Israeli investor, and uh, uh, he has so far committed several hundred million U.S. dollars. And I'll talk about our projects. Uh, but the three questions that we are focused uh, on is: first, is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? Uh, uh, now, I usually get asked the question: Is there intelligent life on Earth? And uh, of course, my answer is that uh, the farther away you are from a national capital, the more likely to find it. Uh, but uh, that's been an ongoing effort. And I'll talk about some of the results on that one. Uh, the second, is there any life in the universe? And this is the question of, uh, of uh, the fundamental astrobiology question. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the progress we've made and some new uh, programs that we're beginning to look at. And then probably the one that to me I find most, uh, most exciting is, can we travel between the stars? And we'll talk about our programs uh, that, we, that we're working for that. Now, the first program we started was uh, uh, has been ongoing actually since 2015. Uh, this is a hundred million dollar effort that uh, is currently led for us uh, at the University of California at Berkeley, although we're uh, transferring a major part of it to the University of Oxford <clears throat> in the next few months. Uh, in this effort, we have time on most of the world's large radio and some of the world's large optical facilities uh, to look for what we call techno signatures. These are uh, uh, evidence of potential uh, uh, alien civilization. Now, I might add we're doing a, a substantial amount of uh, radio astronomy as well. We've got uh, uh, on some of these telescopes, like the Parkes Radio Telescope, uh, the 64 meter in Australia, we have 20% uh, uh, of the time. And then we also are using the, uh, uh, the uh, Green Bank uh, 100 meter, uh, where we have about 15% of the time. And these have actually been quite exciting. Now, the, the interesting thing, of course, is can we find intelligent signals? Uh, I want to talk just briefly about this uh, telescope. This is the Parkes uh, radio telescope. About two years ago, I was called by the principal investigator, uh, Dr. Andrew Simeon from Berkeley, who said he thought they had their first signal. And uh, this was quite exciting. Uh, I, after my second bottle of champagne, I asked him, well, do you think it's real? And he said, well, probably not, but, but it, it met all the, the, the basic requirements. 
Uh, the interesting thing is this appeared to come from the very nearest star system, one which uh, the Proxima Centauri star system uh, that we now know has one, possibly two Earth-sized planets in the habitable zone. Uh, at any rate, uh, for those that question uh, whether the, uh, if anybody found any of these, it would it'd be released or not, uh, we told the whole team until they actually reviewed the data to be quiet. About two days later, uh, we saw this newspaper article. Uh, so uh, I, I think one of the things to understand is that uh, anything in the, in the uh, uh, life elsewhere, particularly intelligent life, is not going to stay very uh, quiet. Uh, it turns out that that uh, this is the signal, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but the reason we believed it's real is that it, it, uh, it is a very narrow band. It drifts in, 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 uh, in frequency, which, which uh, suggests it's outside, it's, it's not on the Earth, uh, although we've now uh, pretty well convinced ourselves that, uh, that this is caused by some sort of human interference, uh, but there were several major papers, and indeed it was the cover story for Nature Astronomy uh, last year, a uh, very exciting effort. Uh, uh, let me turn now to the, the more general search for life. In particular, uh, uh, we've been focused on, on the nearby star system, the Alpha Centauri system, of which Proxima Centauri is a part. Uh, just to kind of remind everybody that star system consists of three stars. Uh, Alpha Centauri A and Alpha Centauri B are more or less solar type, and they orbit around each other in an 80 year period. A very distant star is the red dwarf star of Proxima Centauri, which I, I just mentioned. Uh, this is our primary target for uh, looking for potential life bearing planets, but we're also uh, have a number of programs to look uh, uh, probably out to, to five or 10 parsecs. Uh, in uh, uh, April of, uh, of, uh, of 20, uh, 16, we announced the Breakthrough Watch program. Uh, this was uh, initially a, an effort jointly done with the, uh, the uh, European Southern Observatory. And I might add that about six months after we started it, uh, the European Southern Observatory, uh, uh, you can see in the panel on the right, uh, announced that they had uh, the, uh, a program done there, had discovered a, a, a potential life-bearing planet through indirect means in the Proxima Centauri system. Uh, we mounted a rather major effort with the, uh, with the, uh, 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 the very large telescope in Chile uh, with about 100 hours of time to look very carefully at Alpha Centauri A and B, the solar type stars. Uh, this, is the, this is the telescope. Uh, the, uh, the, the interesting thing, I, I put this picture up. This is from a science fiction uh, movie Avatar, which is from 20, uh, 2019 or 2009. Uh, the reason I put it up is because we have tentative evidence from our data that there is a giant planet orbiting an Alpha Centauri, Alpha Centauri A in the habitable zone. That interestingly enough is the scenario in Avatar. There's a giant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri A, which uh, in this case has, has moons. And one of them is not only inhabitable, it's uh, inhabited. Uh, so this was, this was actually quite exciting to us. We have a, a small satellite program we've just kicked off from the University of Sydney to do astrometric measurements of the Alpha Centauri A and B star. We hope to see a small wobble caused by uh, this planet or other planets in the system that, uh, that we're able to characterize uh, these planets. And we have some other uh, things uh, in the works about uh, actually directly imaging this. So this is really a, a demonstration of starting to do substantial uh, space science uh, with private funding. Now, the, the, the third program is Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, this was announced uh, on uh, April 12th, uh, uh, 2016. It's a hundred million US dollar effort. Uh, uh, you can see the announcement there in the picture with the uh, Yuri Milner and, uh, and Stephen Hawking, who was our principal science advisor until he passed away a few years ago. But this is an effort to try to develop a, a, a probe that we could actually send to the Alpha Centauri system, which means we have to, if we want to get there in a reasonable amount of time, we need to go 20% light speed. Uh, and so we're looking at a laser-driven light sail with a, with a, with a nanocraft, uh, something that weighs grams. Uh, you would leave the, the engine on the Earth and use a, a light sail, which is then propelled by a laser, uh, ground-based laser on the Earth. 
Uh, this program, we've just, we're just completing our first phase of this effort. Uh, you know, the, 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 these missions probably wouldn't happen until later in the century, uh, but it's quite exciting. Uh, this is an artist's conception of what the laser looks like. It's a hundred gigawatt plus laser. Uh, if we're going to the Alpha Centauri system, we would uh, undoubtedly put it in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, in this particular picture, we show it in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, I might add that uh, we, we mentioned putting it in Chile before we told the Chileans, so I have since been summoned and talked to two presidents of Chile uh, that uh, said to, that they're happy to help, but next time, please tell them before we make our announcements. Uh, the, uh, the, this is an artist's conception of the laser firing, and in fact, you probably wouldn't see it because it's at one micron, but uh, uh, it, it uh, then is projected against a, a spherical light sail. It's, uh, there's a number of these carried on a mothership, uh, it is uh, uh, propelled in about an hour's worth of time of laser illumination to 20% light speed. Uh, and then some 20, 25 years later, it flies by uh, without stopping uh, the, the, the targets in the Alpha Centauri system and sends data back via laser. Uh, I'd like to close with just a discussion about, uh, you mentioned about planetary science. Uh, we're very interested in, in where there's life in our solar system. Uh, these are all uh, potential objects. Uh, uh, we, we've managed a couple studies to look at both Enceladus and Europa with privately funded missions. Uh, but the one that's, uh, that looks like it's going forward is we funded effort to look at Venus, Earth's evil twin. Uh, you probably recall a few years ago, there was tentative, uh, although highly controversial discovery of the gas phosphine in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the atmospheric level of Venus. It's uh, sort of Earth temperature and Earth pressure. Uh, but this uh, phosphine on Earth is is almost always associated with life, uh, so we're quite excited about that. Uh, there is a mission that uh, I think other parts of this this uh, this uh, this uh, meeting will be discussing. Uh, but uh, Rocket Lab is planning a mission in a couple of years, and uh, we're looking at, at supporting this with private uh, uh, private money for an instrument. So I think the the answer is that we're seeing a new era of space science uh, that's actually quite exciting. Uh, I'll stop there and, uh, and certainly happy to answer questions uh, now or later. Maybe uh, uh, we should, uh, I guess, give everybody uh, a chance to talk about things because there might be some overlaps and things that everybody is talking. So let's hold off uh, uh, until the end to answer questions. There are already some questions and uh, being posted. So. We're aware of it, and uh, let me ask uh, Chris um, uh, Bosuzan, uh, who um, is, a, as I mentioned, is an astrophysicist, uh, an astronaut, and a musician uh, uh, who who can talk about various aspects of it. But I'm hoping that he'll primarily focus on now uh, about um, uh, privately funded science uh, opportunities. Chris. Yeah, thank you, Supriya, and uh, th thanks, Pete, for your presentation. I have a nice segue from 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 your presentation. It's almost as if we read each other's minds. So, um, yeah, so I began my career um, in the astronomy department at the University of Sydney. I think working with some of Pete's current collaborators, in fact. And one of the missions I worked on earlier, which I'll, I'll share my screen here and show, was this mission called Roma, which was a Danish and Australian proposed collaboration to launch a 32 centimeter telescope. To, uh, to do astro seismology, to measure the pulsations of sun type stars, solar type stars, uh, because one of the issues with studying uh, G, G type stars is we only really have good high fidelity data from one sample, which is our nearest star, our sun. And so this mission was going to collect uh, data, in particular the time series data of the surface oscillations um, to help us determine the chemical compositions of other solar type stars. Uh, midway through my PhD, this program was cancelled, and so I got my first real experience of the space industry, which was from proposal through to cancellation. Um, not deterred, I, um, well, actually, just uh, before I get to that, um, this mission was very similar, in fact, to uh, Kepler and then later TESS. And so at some point, I ended up working with uh, General Warden at NASA Ames. Um, uh, just around the time that this, this spacecraft you see here, Kepler launched. Kepler had the reverse mission, which was to look for uh, planets around other stars, but a secondary mission 
was the asteroid seismology mission and to measure these surface oscillations. And so Kepler has, in asteroid seismology, kicked off a revolution in our understanding of the chemical compositions of, of stars. Uh, many, many, many tens of thousands of stars have been catalogued and have time series. And, uh, and uh, it's been a, almost a renaissance of asteroid seismology due to this mission. Under uh, uh, Dr. Warden's guidance, we were developing uh, our own low-cost programs. Kepler at launch was about $550 million. And in terms of the volume of science that, that Kepler has produced, that satellite is in fact a bargain. Um, it was probably one of the most fruitful and high productivity uh, spacecraft in, in recent years. Um, but we wanted to go even further. And so we were developing this low cost uh, architecture called the Common Bus, which in principle was um, going to be a reusable modular spacecraft that would allow us to sort of not re reinvent the wheel every time NASA wanted to launch a new science mission, but to have a common platform on which we attached our instruments, allowing us to cut budget and cut time and launch science missions more frequently. We discovered through politics that you cannot build a lunar lander in California. Um, and so I had to take the legs off and ended up developing this spacecraft instead, which was an extension of this modular common bus approach um, mission called LADEE that orbited the moon to, de uh, to detect uh, the um, electrostatically driven dust, surface dust that's discharged in the moon as the, uh, as the lunar day proceeds around the planet. Um, this mission uh, was originally proposed for about $80 million and at launch was about $320 million. So about a, a 4X cost overrun, largely due to um, it expanding outside of NASA Ames and, and the NASA machinery, um, sort of taking control of the mission with a capital M and helping ensure mission, to guarantee mission assurance. So somewhere along the way, this vision of a modular, reusable common bus got lost. And I don't think, Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we've ever launched a second one of that modular design. So that work was, was not really used. So even though this mission LADEE was also a scientific success, it was disappointing from the engineering side that we weren't able to, um, to really revolutionize how spacecraft were developed. At the time, a colleague of us, ours, a guy by the name of uh, Pete Klupa, used to pull his phone out and brandish it around saying, you know, my phone is smarter than your satellite. And in fact, he was correct. And at the time, I think he may have not even, this might've been pre iPhone, I think he had a government issued Palm Pilot or Blackberry. So even that archaic phone was probably still better than most computers in space and most instruments in space on many spacecraft that were launched around that time. So at some point we took Pete seriously and started to put uh, some, you know, we actually got a, this is a Google, uh, Motorola Google Android phone. We put it in a vacuum chamber and tested it and to our great surprise, it actually worked in vacuum. Um, and then later on, we launched some on a sounding rocket as well. And we, we did a number of uh, successful launches out in the desert as well as some failed launches. And what we discovered is that modern consumer electronics, um, off the shelf hardware, um, work very well um, in space. In fact, so well that even on one of the failed launches, our device still worked. On this particular rocket, there was an issue and the rocket uh, second stage separated prematurely. There was a NASA biosciences payload that was about a meter long in the upper stage of the rocket. When the rocket crashed into the desert, the NASA payload crushed down to about maybe 15 centimeters and then drove itself into our phone, which is also running some software inside the, the rocket and uh, cracked the screen as you can see in this picture. But to our great surprise, the phone still booted and we were able to get our data off. And so this was a $500 instrument um, that appeared to be very robust, very suitable for space. And in fact, it was this picture that, um, that gave uh, Pete the confidence to back us to attempt to put some of these in space. This very damaged phone was the piece of evidence we provided that perhaps there was a bear there to flying lower cost hardware in space. So at, again, at NASA Ames, we developed a project called the PhoneSat, which was um, essentially a thought experiment in what, in what is the highest capability, lowest cost piece of hardware you could fly in space. And so we proposed to launch three Android phones inside of a CubeSat structure. Here we have an acrylic box demonstrating the 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube that we put these phones in, to put them into orbit as free flying satellites and attempt to write space software as if it was software you might put on the app store for your phone. Um, it was sort of an experiment in radical low cost um, uh, hardware and software development for space. And in fact, this mission was a success. After some high altitude balloon testing, um, we launched one, in, launched three of them into space. All three spacecraft worked. 
and we took uh, this is one of the many pictures that the, sat, the, the, the phone sats return from orbit. So you have to remember this is a uh, a uh, you know an eight megapixel cell phone camera with a tiny lens and tiny aperture, but this is taken from orbit at 400 kilometers by a phone, um, and the entire mission cost to launch all three phones was about uh, $250,000, including the launch. So um, it was about 500 for the phone, about five, about 3,000 US dollars for the box, and about 75,000 US dollars each for the launch inside a, a CubeSat dispenser. So here we had a fairly remarkable outcome. We had in our back pocket as much space capability as many national space programs around the world, and yet we'd accomplished this for $75,000. The key turning point at that moment was we then um, got very excited and went to NASA headquarters saying, looking at the decadal survey for future space constellation missions and proposed that with this technology approach, we could cut maybe a zero off the price and do some of these missions for a tenth of the, the budgeted cost. And uh, actually we laughed out of the room at the time because this idea just didn't appear credible and was so different than how spacecraft were built. We were essentially um, rejected by, had an antibody reaction inside the organization of NASA and didn't find any takers for this approach. So like uh, all good entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, we drank our own Kool-Aid and started a company. So we moved out of NASA um, and uh, founded Planet Labs. The idea being that if spacecraft really are this cheap and um, you can just replace the cell phone camera with a better instrument, what could you actually do? And our proposal was to launch a constellation of Earth imaging satellites, um, with, you know, essentially 100 satellites to monitor the entire Earth every day at about three to five meter resolution, which we proceeded to do. So after raising some money, we developed this spacecraft. You can see some differences. This is actually uh, um, has a proper scientific uh, telescope in it. It's a, it's a um, 100 millimeter F1.14, um, 114, sorry, yeah, one, one meter, 1.114 meter uh, focal length telescope, um, giving us a ground resolving resolution of about three to five meters. Um, we have some high speed radios to address the issue of there not being any cell phone service in space. And uh, the telescope actually takes up almost the entirety of this 3U CubeSat volume. And because we were using hardware that was just one step removed from a phone, a cell phone, we were buying the chips and components and leveraging $3 billion of investment in high, high performance, low power computing devices that we keep in our pocket, we were able to concentrate the spacecrafty parts, the spacecraft bus, the electronics, the battery packs and all of that in the space around the telescope. So this satellite you see here is, is almost all telescope, which is very different than say the picture of Kepler I showed or the mission I had developed in the past, which is what I call a box of boxes. You have a box for a radio, a box for a telescope or your payload, a box for the attitude control system, a box for the power system, and a lot of empty space as you stack these boxes inside a large box. This satellite is all telescope with the um, computing apparatus essentially glued like postage stamps around the telescope, which allowed us to fit many, many more of these on a, on a, on a launch vehicle and to launch a constellation relatively cheaply. So if you recall that grainy cell phone picture I showed a moment ago, after launching uh, the first round of these satellites, this is the first image we got back from space from our Planet Lab satellites. This is, as I mentioned about a three in this picture, it's actually this is probably closer to 2.5 meter GSD in this image. Um, and this is a uh, plantation pine forest um, in uh, northern, uh, I think just outside Seattle in Washington state in the United States. And it's quite remarkable. You can see a lot of details in this picture. You can see individual trees. Uh, one of my personal goals is to be able to count every tree on the planet, which we now can do at Planet Labs. Um, you can see uh, areas of clearing and active forestry management. You can see roads, rivers, power lines, and, and many, many small details. Uh, excited by this first launch, we then proceeded to launch and manufacture many, many more of these uh, at scale. Here you can see um, what I meant about the telescope really filling up the entirety of the CubeSat. The actual, you can see on this image here on the frontmost satellite or, or the one on the top left, uh, the white cylinder is actually the camera. And so the, the entire CubeSat is a telescope. And in the bottom one, before the solar panels have been added, you can see where the circuit boards are just wrapping around the focal path of the telescope, taking up the empty space there. Um, 
And so that, and here's a launch of a video of one of the satellites coming out of, uh, from the International Space Station. In the early days, we also cut costs significantly by launching our developmental versions of the hardware from the ISS. The orbit is not ideal for RF imaging, but it allowed us to rapidly iterate our design and uh, resolve any issues we had with focus and uh, image quality before launching the constellation at scale into the proper orbits. Um, and then just some pictures. Uh, this is actually a, um, for comparison, this is actually a sh shot out of the window of the International Space Station taken by an astronaut. Um, and so you can see from the altitude of the station down to the ground, uh, two of our spacecraft uh, just passing out of, out, of, out of range of the space station. And here's some pictures. So this is um, this is a glacier. Um, uh, uh, I think this one is uh, in uh, northern Sweden area. Um, this is one of my favorite images. This is the um, the Chilean Andes. Um, you can see one side of the hill has already gone into um, fall, and the, and the other side is still in in uh, summer. And so the trees have started turning red on one side, on the shadier side of the mountains, but not yet on the um, on the sunnier side, which is quite a quite a cool picture. Um, there's a lot of applications in uh, you know in economics and business as well. This is uh, coal-fired power plants power plants in Inner Mongolia. Um, so there's huge applications for finance, hedge funds, um, commodities trading, and so on. Um, and then one of another favorite image. This is uh, downtown Sydney. There's a lot of applications for this data in terms of monitoring urbanization. Um, growth of city areas, as well as uh, movements of migrant populations across the surface of the earth. And a picture of uh, Uluru in the center of Australia. And uh, this is an example of a seasonal lake um, that is transient. This is Lake McDonald in Western Australia. Um, this lake is not always there, but it's the, what you're looking at here is about 10 centimeters of water. But every few years it rains and this lake fills up um, and producing these beautiful colors. And uh, just before uh, Paul Allen passed away, Paul Allen, uh, of, uh, founder of Microsoft, um, we announced a project with, his with the Paul Allen Foundation to monitor every coral reef on the planet. And so Planet, uh, planet Labs now extends our imaging area off the land area to about 100 kilometers offshore from every land area, including all islands. So we are capturing essentially all of the coastal reefs of the entire planet on a daily basis. And I think with that, I will stop. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, we will, uh, uh, we're, we're uh, running a little late. So we'll straight go straight to Alfreda's talk, who is gonna give you some examples of how these type of data that have been uh, collected by Planet Labs and other uh, entities are being used by uh, they're collected by uh, NASA and then given off to uh, scientists uh, for detailed analysis. So, okay, can everyone see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Alfreda Hall. I am the project manager for our uh, commercial small set data acquisition program. So this um, presentation can be a little different. It's gonna give you an overview of our program. And then um, because of all of the science that we um, have uh, publications on, I'll provide that information that you could um, go to the website to get more information on that. But I do have with me, um, Dr. Compton Tucker, who is the program senior um, sign advisor so he may can answer any scientific questions that you may have later on. So we will get started now. So the um, so from here I'll be talking about the data, commercial data and how what we kind of do to um, get it ready for the uh, more of a broader um, usage. So we started out as a pilot in um, November of 2017 basically to evaluate data from operating commercial constellations for research and applied science activities with the main goal to augment and complement Earth um, observations, our NASA observations precise, in a cost-effective way. So we started out in um, September of 2018 by issuing 
um, black blanket purchase agreements, we call them BPAs, to um, Maxar, Maxar, which normally formerly known as Digital Globe, Planet Labs, um, and Spire Global. So the pilot successfully ended in 2020, uh, which established our sustained program that we have today. And um, during the pilot and all of our um, subsequent on ramps, we have principal investigators, what we call PIs, selected to evaluate the commercial data on a set of evaluation criteria. So for the pilot, um, and when that ended, it was determined that the data was favorable for NASA to continue to purchase for scientific use. But one of the um, major um, findings from that resulted in um, uh, noted that the licenses that we had for the pilot was difficult and hindered um, scientific um, collaborations with their peers. To the right, you would see um, just a, a, a front page of the evaluation report, which we have on our website. That evaluation report um, basically summarized the findings from the evaluation from the pilot, as well as recommendations from the agencies and the scientists going forward. So each of our Frida, evaluations will um, result in a summary evaluation report on the website so that um, users can um, review it and get um, more detailed information on that. Alfreda, so may, may I interrupt you? I'm sorry? Could you please put your presentation in presentation mode because we are just seeing only the uh, first page uh, and... and um, uh. Uh, okay. Somebody recommended that you put it in the presentation mode. Thank you. Okay, well, I have it in presentation mode um, on my screen, so let me... I, I think, Alfredo, you just shared the wrong screen with us. You have to uh, stop the share and uh -huh. then grab the one that's the full screen one. Okay. You, you should see two PowerPoints, then you can just grab the full screen. Okay, let's see. Um, I stopped the share. Uh, and I'm using Zoom, which we <laughs> is not, um, let's see, in, in, let me try this again, sorry. Unfortunately, Zoom is putting some restrictions on me. So let me try sharing the screen again, uh, entire screen maybe. Entire screen. Um, yes, that sounds good. Okay. So is that the same result? You may want to click on the uh, screen. That might help, but that's okay. I mean, you could or click on this slide that you want to show. That might just do the job. All right. So it's um, it's uh, how are the slides now? They're still not in full. Mode? You are on two, slide two. But it didn't work, Alfredo. We just see your the editor, not the full screen. So maybe just close the full screen and click through the, the presentation um, manually. Okay, let me, let me just try that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm sure it should be able to help. Okay. So now, is it any better? Yeah, that would work. Just click on each slide here and we should be fine. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, we don't use Zoom. We actually um, use Teams and WebEx. So, all right. So we'll continue that. So basically, um, giving an idea of the um, pilot that we had in place, which started in November 2017. So now we are um, on wrapping our second set of vendors, which is on ramp two, and they um, include uh, Airbus US for SAR data and black sky for optical imagery. That particular evaluation is underway for a year. 
And after the um, valuations um, is completed, the actual commercial data will be available for um, more usage. And we are half in um, Elm Ram 3, our procurements, which are underway for uh, four more new vendors, Capella Space, ISI US, Optical, Geo Optics, and um, GHG Set. The program has established um, our uh, four major objectives. And again, started out with the establishing a continuous and repeatable process to bring on new vendors. As I mentioned, we are working with the um, our third set of vendors to come online. Um, after the successful completion of an evaluation of the data, um, that data and, if, and the determination to um, continue to purchase that data we move into what we call a sustained phase in which that purchase data um, is being continually used in a broader sense by the earth science community. And as long uh, with the NASA earth observation data, we will preserve our purchase data alongside that data. And then to continually to co coordinate with other government agencies and internal partners on evaluations and scientific use of commercial data where it is permissible. To give you a feel of the licenses that we have associated with the program, um, as I mentioned from the pilot, we moved from um, NASA only licenses to more government wide license. Um, and we now have three licenses that are associated with each um, vendor that we bring on, and they are um, summarized here in this chart where we have uh, what we call our full U.S. government, federal government license, which includes the um, U.S. government as well as the state, local, tribal, and academia, um, the contractors and grantees that work with that particular agency that we entitled that license USG, USG license, and um, our next tier is the U.S. G plus, which is the US federal government, um, all of that that's included in the federal government, but we add um, potential uh, international partners to that. And then of course the public release. All of our licenses associated with the program are for scientific use, non-commercial use only. Um, in terms of collaborating with other agencies, we've worked with the, um, with the NRO office and basically modeled our tier structure um, after their family of EULAs. And once we had established the um, various licenses, the tiers that we have, we worked with our vendors from the pilot who is currently in the um, sustained phase to uh, uplift their license. So we were able to uplift um, licenses that we have with Aspire to be a full U.S. government license, and we have full access to their um, GNSS scientific data catalog. Um, for Planet, we have a broader license to include the federal civil agencies, the National Science Foundation, and their funded researchers to um, have access to this data. We have access to Planet, our um, their full Planet Scope and Rapid Eye Archive. Um, the data from these licenses are on a 30-day latency and, again, use of scientific use only. So um, from on-ramp two on, um, as we go continue with the program, all three licenses will be associated with the contract with the ability for NASA to um, perform uplifts if it is deemed necessary and budget, of course, permits. To give you a feel of um, our current data holdings that we have uh, with the program, um, these are listed here are the data types or the vendors that we have in our sustained phase. Um, as I mentioned before, we have Planet uh, Spire, um, some um, digital global Maxar data. We have Teledyne and Brian data from the DSIS instrument, which we have a cooperative agreement 
for that data um, flying on the ISS, and then uh, a um, subset of the Polis Geospatial Center Earth Dim product. To give you a look of the future, um, all of this data, if you're familiar with the, EOS, the NASA EOS disk system and the Earth Data Search Client, um, we are um, in development and soon to be operational. Um, a data search where you can search and discover the commercial data that we have in our holdings um, via the Earth Data Search Client um, interface. So you will be able to um, put a search in to identify um, NASA holdings as well as the commercial data license holdings that we have. Um, you'll be able to search and view, um, but any download access will be, of course, uh, applicable to the various license. And I will end with just this um, chart here. Um, if you want to take a picture of the screen um, with the um, QR code here to the website, the main website that will give you an overview of the program. Um, you can um, find locations of presentations and um, publications, which you would see that last um, link there of all of the science that have been done with the data from the program um, to date. Um, and um, that's all I have. I, again, I apologize for the technical difficulties here um, with the program and here to answer any questions. If we have any science-related questions, questions um, Dr. Tucker can answer uh, yeah, so those thank, you. thank you very much, indeed. Um, there are some questions already posted in the chat. So the first one uh, is, as to the questions, uh, are we alone? Is there any new directions being taken to see who might be out there? Well, Pete, I think uh, <laughs> this is straight at you. Well, well the, uh, the key uh, question here is, uh, you know, of course, I want to emphasize that that uh, you know that we're doing a much more thorough search than ever been done before. We're hopefully with uh, not just our program but others, uh, most of which are privately funded. We would like to uh, observe the million nearest stars, and uh, at least to see if there's a signal. Uh, what we're trying to do is expand the the uh, the wavelength and frequency range and sensitivity, uh, and also the thoroughness of the searches. Uh, I, I didn't get into a lot of detail, but we're looking at for potential laser signals. We have two major instruments for that. Uh, one is the automated planet finder to look at some of the very nearest stars. And the other one is the, uh, is the Veritas array in uh, Arizona that it does, looks for gamma ray flashes, but it can also look for laser flashes. Uh, that, uh, so we're, we're trying to go from, you know, very low frequencies to, to optical frequencies uh, and to, to do a, a comprehensive search of all the nearby stars. Uh, that's probably the, the, the major effort uh, that uh, we're also looking for things that might <clears throat> indicate what we call uh, uh, artifacts. So, you know, these other things would be active signals either accidentally released by a, a technological civilization or deliberately released. But there's also the possibility there could be artifacts that could have been a civilization that, that built major structures in, a, in, a, uh, in their solar system, the, the so-called Dyson spheres. Uh, and so we're looking for things that, that look out of the ordinary. And uh, uh, the, people may recall a few years ago, there was a a uh, discovery of a uh, in the Kepler database, the Kepler mission database of a of a, an object uh, dubbed sort of uh, Tabby Star because it was named after Dr. Tabitha Boyarjan, as a was a postdoc that uh, along with some you know, some uh, you know sort of citizen scientists identified this. That initially one of the reports was it might have been a a Dyson sphere that was causing very strange light curves, and we now believe it was it was dust. So. There's a lot of different efforts to look for this uh, uh, direct signals, leakage, meaning you know that they have a civilization that is, is releasing signals in, in a lot of different frequencies, and finally looking for artifacts. Um, th there are two others that are sort of related, uh, and I'll try to combine and see if it makes sense to you. So, uh, the first part is why does NASA still work with large NGOs uh, who don't seem to have NASA or the public's interest at heart? 
with regards to deadlines and cost. And then the other one is, is there an accord or agreement among NGOs and private space companies akin to the Artemis Accords uh, to ensure cooperative effort, efforts and multiple mutual support uh, aid in space? I don't know who this goes to, Chris uh, and Alfreda, I would let you take. Uh, I'm an university guy, so I cannot address this. I don't see that question in the chat. So can you just re re rephrase the last part again? Um, it it's talks about, is there an accord or agreement among NGOs and private space companies akin uh, to the Artemis Accords to ensure cooperative efforts and mutual support aid in space? Since I'm not familiar with the Artemis Accords or the details of it, I cannot and I haven't addressed that. Yeah, and I'm not sure what that, what the context is for NGOs, unless it's maybe referring to things like breakthrough. Um, but yeah, can't answer yeah. that one, sorry. <laughs> right, the one just came in, what level of processing is done on this satellite to reduce the data volume to get such good quality images? Is the data beamed directly down to Earth or through other communication satellites? What's the data volume from one of these satellites in orbit? I think it's probably either of you um, could probably address this. Is that for Alfredo or for me vis-a-vis -vis planet? You and or Pete probably. Oh yeah. Yeah, so the Planet Labs, we um because we, you know, we're now using um we're not really using a phone anymore, we're using a bunch of um Hot, more high-speed complex radios that we've built out of um, similar chipsets for the phones, but we're building our own now. So we have pretty massive downlink speed. We have an X-band radio and we use uh, two to five meter dishes on the ground. So we actually can get down a couple of um, gigabytes per day per satellite. Um, so we actually download uh, very high resolution, high bit depth raw files that are then um, color corrected on the ground. And there's a huge data pipeline that does a number of things, including correcting for parallax errors and often ADA pointing issues, um, dealing with uh, uh, cloud and um, atmospheric haze removal, um, color calibration, time of day calibration, seasonal adjustments, um, as well as other um, uh, sort of, you know, in particular also dealing with elevation and correcting uh, parallax induced by changes across mountains and different pointing angles. So. The images uh, that you see uh, have gone through each probably a couple of hours of, of digital post-processing um, on the ground uh, based on you know, the orbit and time of day and things like that. Uh, yeah, I, I may be able to answer the uh, the Artemis Accord question. Uh, uh, just to remind uh, everybody on on the uh, on this call, the uh, the Artemis Accords were signed a few years ago, and they are. Uh, I think there's probably. 12 or 15 different space agencies or nations that have signed them that are a series of, of, of agreements relating to uh, lunar exploration and uh, agreements to work together, agreements how to handle resources and things that are needed. Uh, there is not a, a broader uh, equivalent of that for public-private partnership uh, other, than, other than saying that uh, that there is a lot of cooperation between space agencies, uh, science agencies, and in private sector. We have a number of agreements uh, ourselves between, uh, uh, for example, a lot of our, uh, our our work we're doing in Australia is with uh, CSIRO, the, uh, the, the, the Australian Science Agency. Uh, we have some discussions and agreements with NASA, Space Act agreements that, uh, that deal with uh, cooperation. Uh, so there, there's certainly a lot of, I guess those would be called bilateral, uh, but there does not yet exist sort of a global protocol or agreement between science agencies, space agencies, and, and NGOs, uh, other than saying that that uh, there there are international agreements on things like uh, 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 planetary protection and so on that uh, everyone is obligated to uh, to work with. Uh, there is again an increased cooperation with private individuals and pri or private groups. Uh, for example, our foundation on, uh, on Starshot is working closely with uh, uh, an institute called the Limitless Space Institute. Uh, they're looking at, uh, at uh, propulsion schemes that may eventually enable humans to travel 
between the stars where we're looking at really at side tipping ones. So, so I think the, the general question of cooperation is that uh, in, in agreements, they're beginning, they tend to be between two organizations rather than multi-organizations, but clearly we need to move in a direction for some global efforts, because I think you're going to see private space science, public space science, and 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 combinations in public-private partnerships uh, will will be uh, increase a lot in the next few uh, years. Uh, th th thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other uh, uh, questions in the chat. Um, well, <laughs> as I said, there is another one just showed up. Uh, how well photometrically calibrated are the instruments? Typical scientists like to deal with raw rather than heavily processed images. So I, I guess um, this is Alfreda. We can answer this between myself and Jim. Um, we do, <laughs> you know, as as mentioned there from NASA in terms of our evaluations. Um, of course, the raw, the data, the the lower processing, the happier our scientists are. Um, so they can take that, you know, to do their specific evaluations. Um, so we do um, evaluate as large as, you know, the raw, the data that we can and in terms of the different levels that we have. So we have criteria and we have, um, I'll just say, um, SMEs in place to do data quality on it, geolocation on it, um, on those particular data. So we do evaluate um, what the vendors have. The law is um, very acceptable to us. I don't know, Jim, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes. What we do extensively with all of our commercial satellite data is we determine the absolute uh, geolocation accuracy. We also investigate and document the, radio, the radiometric accuracy. Um, and we also are actively working on improving the aerosol optical depth and the cloud cover information because with only a few uh, CubeSat bands, you cannot do very well with cloud cover or aerosol optical depth. And these are, are aspects of the data which NASA with, this, with its satellites which cover the, the spectrum from the, from the reflective region into the emissive spectral, spectral region can deal with very well. And so we are actively working with Planet Labs, for example, to improve their aerosol optical depth and their cloud cover retrievals. Just got another uh, question. Yeah. What uh, other... Supriya, can I just add to that question? Yeah. Just uh, yeah, thanks, Jim and, and Alfreda, for that excellent answer. So, yeah, just to clarify that, you know, obviously our images aren't digitally altered. What we do is we produce a series of transform files that ride along with the original raw image. So you can obtain any level of, of data you want. You can get the raw unprocessed file or, you know, author rectified, but not. Uh, you know, radiometrically corrected or the reverse if you so wish. Um, and we provide all of the levels of processing through our API. Um, so you can kind of cook the processing to your own uh, satisfaction depending on what your application is. And if you want the raw data to start again, as, as Jim mentioned, where you want to actually um, run a new correction on the data, that's possible as well. So all, all levels of processing are available via the API. Thank you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You're aware of that. And, and we work, our, our preference is to work with the raw data and then go from there and, and not use even slightly derived versions of the, of the original data. Uh, there is a, uh, another question. What other considerations are there when partnerships are formed? Uh, uh, that is contract negotiation, union requirements, et cetera. Um, I don't know who 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 it's directed to, uh, but um. so I, I guess in terms of um, NASA, in terms of um, you know um, vendors or 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 mapping new vendors into the program, we do um, do our market research and we'll be doing it annually. Um, so the requirements will be posted. Um, and uh, on, on the government site so that interested um, 
you know, partnerships could be gained from there. But we do have, we will have on there the science requirements that we'd be needing and um, the qualifications there. So um, we will have a, a draft RFP coming out very soon. Um, so, if, you know, if they're interested um, individuals or vendors that are out there, we can take a look at that. And so we do have specific requirements and gates for getting into the program. And first gate, once um, a vendor qualifies, we do evaluate the data before we determine if we will continue to um, purchase that. And the, uh, one other thing I want oh, to bring out, you. the, the um, um, full USG I think license. there was another follow-up to the question, but okay. I think it was addressed. All right, so thank you. I don't know if you have any, if you had any more questions. Um, the only thing I can, um, one other thing I wanted to add in terms of the licenses for um, full US government licenses um, for a particular vendor, again, it depends on the vendor. It does have, um, as one of the licensed user, a NGO, uh, but it has to be the full USD license. And for example, like Spire um, does have that associated with their license. Um, there, uh, there is a follow-up question. Um, uh, looks like it's for Chris. It says planet specific questions. How long is a typical exposure? Are there multiple geolocated ground stations? What kind of transmission power do you use? Uh, I, I don't know how how uh, detailed you want to get here, but uh, yeah, like yeah. I mean, on the ground station thing, there's the and and the transmission power. There's um, we have you know uh, many 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 ground stations all around the world um, because you know we have hundreds of satellites and um, you know they're operating all day, so we do have to get the data down. So we have a more than enough ground stations to get stuff down. The more interesting question there is the, is the typical exposure. Um, and so one of the things we pioneered at Planet was um, integrating with a uh, CCD. So as the satellite moves forward, um, we don't actually take a 2D uh, picture. Um, most satellites actually have a line sensor. So they have like a, a mode called push broom sensing where they fly forward and sweep the ground with a line. We actually use a um, full um, frame sensor but instead of taking a single photo with a short exposure, we align the sensor with the velocity vector of the spacecraft and shuffle the, the pixels across the whole sensor, which allows us to do fairly arbitrary uh, numbers of um, milliseconds of exposure, uh, more uh, allowing us to, um, depending on the latitude, change the exposure time to give us more or less sensitivity, um, which has really helped uh, one, it's been one of the biggest factors driving our increase in signal to noise. Um, so the, sh the exposure time is variable depending on, on latitude um, and uh, um, it's, it's something a variable we can control to, to optimally expose the image in each case. Well, um, with that, I should uh, thank uh, the panelists and uh, also thank the gods of internet because I, you, can, you have seen that there have been uh, some uh, glitches in this and many of us are, most of us are probably uh, not in the US and trying to do it from across the ocean and, and things are probably somehow their bits are getting dropped uh, here and there. Um, uh, I, I would really like to thank uh, all of uh, the panelists uh, for their insights and uh, vision for, for the future. Uh, and we it it's, looks like, at least to me, uh, the exciting times are ahead for doing scientific research using non-traditional sources of data, space-based non-traditional sources of data. And um, thank you for leading uh, these efforts. And uh, I, I would like to thank all of you. Uh, with that, uh, we'll, we'll thank the participants, great questions. Uh, and um, I will see you again uh, sometime soon, hopefully. Goodbye. Thanks, Thanks Priya. So much. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Alfredo. Thank you, Peter. Right, bye -bye. Yes. Thanks. Afraid of?